welcome to the Premi Chats. Premi Chat is our weekly educational sessions for healthcare professionals and parents to talk about what matters to you, to explore new ideas, and to learn together. I'm Fabiana Bacchini. I am a Premi Parent and Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, as known as CPBF, and I'm happy to be your host today. CPBF is a parent-led charitable organization that helps families in and after the NICU through support, education, and advocacy. If you have a heart for premise, whether you are a family or a healthcare professional, please check our website at canadianpremise.org. There you'll find resources, the latest projects, and most importantly, a community of people who want to see our little babies thrive. If you're watching live, please bring your voice to this table, leave comments and questions in the chat, and we'll try to address them during our program. It is through rich conversations like this that we can advance practice and learn together. So please participate and let us know where you're watching from. And today's topic is uh, responsive parent. It is a part two of uh, a two video series with Maureen Luther, and today is all about play as a learning. Uh, experience for for children. So play for children is their way of learning. It is like medicine for their emotional well-being. Uh, Maureen Luther will discuss how play helps development and provide strategies on how to be a responsive playmate. And I have here join me live from Toronto, Maureen Luther, who is a pediatric physiotherapist. She has taught nationally and internationally on topics regarding prematurity developmentally supported care and outcome for preterm infants. She's currently partially, partially retired from Sunnybrook Health Sciences, uh, where she worked in the NICU and the neonatal follow-up clinic for many years. Maureen continues to participate in educational and research projects. Maureen, thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm very excited about this session. And for people who actually missed part one, Maureen was on our session on March 31st, 2023. So if you go to our website or YouTube videos, you can see part one. So Maureen, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Fabiana. So for all of you watching us live today, please do send your comments and questions to Maureen. We're going to address them at the end of her presentation. Maureen, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to talk today, sort of continuing the conversation that we had uh, the last time about trying to understand and be responsive to your baby. And the last talk was about the babies when they're in the NICU. And now we're branching out from the NICU. Um, basically, I'm going to cover sort of the first two years. But my talk is not to give specific activities. It's more to give guidelines, things to think about when you're playing with your child. And in actual fact, playing isn't sometimes as simple um, as we think, especially I remember I love to play. And as I was thinking about trying to play with children of all ages and was sort of looking into some of the literature, it's actually a science unto itself. And there are many, many people who have studied it, have researched it, really some brilliant minds. Um, who have looked at play and how important it is for children. It's how they learn. It's how they develop. And for them, it's like medicine for their soul. So if they're emo emotionally stressed or, or there's anything that's negative that's happening, play is often the way that the parents and the child will connect. And if you learn or I can give you some strategies and some guidelines, this will help make it a little bit more uh, productive and very rewarding for not only for your child, because your child is going to learn through play, but you yourself are going to learn from your child through play. A very famous psychologist, Vygotsky, talked about how much adults can actually learn from their child through play. So it's something that it's, it's really worth thinking about and trying to learn about and um, and very rewarding because there's nothing better than a child playing with you no matter what age and those great pleas of laughter when it, it's going right. So when we look at that sort of child parent um, interaction um, and we're looking at it through play, so we look at the parent um, 
and now I have to say at this point, a lot of the studies are very traditional in the past and they talk a lot about the, the maternal um, interaction, but obviously it's parent. It's both the loving uh, people who are involved with the child, um, who I'm sort of referring to as the parent. Because the parent is the principal person of which this development is going to happen. And when we talk about um, the parent, it's that person that's going to um, make that healthy, loving relationship. So with the child. So it's that it's that person that the child looks back to or comes to for comfort, uh, may try and move away, but they keep looking back to make sure, are you watching me? Are you there for me? Um, and so... And when that, when the child or the baby has that understanding that somebody is really in love with them, they are really invested in them, that helps the baby then in himself want to learn and helps to helps them to attain, attain regulation. And in other words, that they can be calm. And when they're calm, you can learn. And so that becomes a real learning moment. So babies have to understand that there's somebody invested in them, that there's somebody who really loves them and wants to help them. And then that helps their learning process. And parents also have to retain or attain what's called reflective functioning. So reflective functioning is that you're able to look at your child and you understand or you get a sense that, okay, they're frustrated, they're, they're angry, they're crying, but it's not to annoy you, or it's not to be purposely out to make you annoyed or make you angry. It's that they themselves are stressed, they're uncomfortable, they have a sense of frustration. Um, so you understand their behavior within their capacity. So for instance, uh, a six month old baby has no real cognition that if I do this, this is going to happen. And that's what's frustrating me. So it's you have that ability to look at your baby as a separate entity and to really understand that what's happening to them is related to sort of their age and their development. And you have that capacity to then respond appropriately to them and to help them. Um, and so that leads us that we want to be able to respond and and help their babies. And you're just able to look at some of those subtle or very clear cues. So a subtle cue is that they're no longer able to look right at you, that they're starting to look away from you. So something about what they're doing is sort of showing that they're, they're stressed or they're actually looking at you, they're calm. And so you understand that they're really engaged with you versus a potent cue would be that they're crying, they're moving away. So you really understand, okay, now they're really frustrated. But at the same hand, some crying and frustration is now normal. We need to accept that that's going to happen as we start, especially to move away from the unit. In the unit, it was all about stress reduction. And now as we move into the first year, the second year, we're going to see lots of crying and frustration. But I think the main message is to be there, to be available. And often that comes through play. And so they may be frustrated with the play activity, but if you just sit and wait and pause, and then you, they know that you're available to them, then you, they'll, that will also help them calm and to learn. And so a parent also becomes the expert of your child. By watching, being there, playing, you become a real expert as to your child's temperament um, and how they react to certain things, and then eventually on to their personality. And a baby, their goal, especially within the first few months, is to achieve that self-regulation, that they can be comfortable in their environment, that they're not overwhelmed by everything, and that they are they have moments of comfort, stability, awareness, um, and then they may be frustrated, they can cry, and they get response from their parent, and then that's how they move on. Falling in love means that they're falling in love with their parent, they have a specific person, that they are uh, persons that they're very attached to and they they learn this, they get this attachment with this person. So this falling in love phase, they learn to communicate, they learn to start communicating their needs, their desires, what they, what they need at that moment um, or that they're really enjoying what's happening. So this is their way of learning about themselves, about their environment and this then helps their ongoing development. And when we look at development, um, so first I talk about this part is that 
Development is sort of made up of motor skills, so fine and gross motor. And in the first year, it, gross motor is really driving overall development. Then we have language, we have expressive language, that's the ability to say things. And then we have receptive language, so the ability to understand what is being said to us. We have cognition, which is problem solving, thinking, working things out. And we have social emotional skills. So that ability to be happy, comfortable, self-regulation, that's what I've talked about. And that adaptive behavior, so appropriate behaviors in the at the appropriate time. And one of the key ways to help all of these areas of development who are very closely connected, especially in that first year or always, um, is through things such as attention. So that ability to be able to attend to an object, to an, um, something in the environment, a person. And so that ability to be able to attend is also a very key to be able to help overall development. Interaction, being able to interact back and forth with somebody. And then finally, this very important key to learning is what's called joint or shared attention. That starts around about nine months um, and should be well in place by about 18 months. And so it's that um, when they sort of point to some, but something uh, like, you know, mommy switches or mommy or daddy switches on the light and you sort of point up to the light. And so they both look to the light. So it's that capacity that the parent and the baby or the child are both looking at the same thing and they're enjoying what they're looking at. And so that's called joint attention. Um, and so, again, just a little bit more so that attention, the ability to focus um, and select a relevant stimuli or a relevant toy, so very key. And we, and we want to achieve these things. We want to help our baby um, develop these things so that they, through our play, we're helping them develop that ability to pay attention and to stay with something um we are interacting with them so we we grade how we respond to the baby so that they can interact with us in a very nice way and this is also now going to help them learn and their overall development and that ability that shared attention so we help them gain our attention we main help them maintain that attention and then maybe shift to something else so it's these three they're very key elements for learning and we do that, we help them um, achieve all of these things through play. And what better way and what, what more fun way to do it. So that's why I'm calling this the rules of engagement. I'm not giving you specific activities to actually do, but more guidelines. So as I said, children need to play. They need to play inside, outside. They need to sort of play quietly. They need to play actively, robustly, quite rambunctious. Um, and so it's important that they can play in all different ways. Um, and the main thing for us is we sort of follow their lead. Um, we kind of, we learn to join what they're doing. So if they're sitting with a block and they're banging it on a pot, you may very well go up and bang on the pot with the block. It doesn't matter how they play with that toy. So it's not for us to go up there and say, oh, no, 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 that's not what we do with that toy. This is what we do with the toy. I'm sure you all remember in our own childhood, um, if we had that bossy friend, whoa, she was the first one, you're out of there because they just, they kind of ruined the play. So you just go along with what they're doing. Doesn't matter. Uh, as I said, what they're doing, you're just going to imitate them. There's no bigger compliment than somebody imitating you. And so it's like, wow, okay. I must be really important. Mommy is imitating, daddy is imitating me as I'm doing this. So we become the coaches. Uh, we're not the leader. We're not gonna direct how this play is gonna happen, but we may guide them maybe to try it something a little bit different. So maybe they're banging the top of the pot and you may then turn and bang the side of the pot. So some of these are my examples are very simplistic, uh, but as you're playing and you're aware, you start to learn, oh yeah, let's try it this way. Um, so it's just that you're there to coach, to try and do it a little bit different, try it a, just a little bit of a different way. And then you're not going after the child. You're not going to pursue them. Oh, do this, do this. You're going to pause and you're going to wait for them maybe to come back to you. So you may do it some one way and they, they're not really sure about that. So just pause, just wait. 
and they may, they probably, they may, oh, that's enough. We've had enough today or they'll come back, but it's always very important to pause, wait, be patient um, and see what their response is. Again, all about being responsive. Uh, you're going to go slowly. So for instance, this baby is attending, paying really great attention to this little block. So it's okay at this point just to sit back, pause, wait. Um, you may decide, okay, let's see if I go with my own little block and I start to bang on it. Now we're sort of teaching her, okay, now we're going to bring two objects together. Um, so you may start that game or we may just, she may sort of tumble with the block over and over and you may sort of then repeat it yourself with your own little block, but you're going to provide just enough help. You're not going to provide too much. And we know that they're paying. We know that it's going well because they're paying attention. They keep playing with the little block or the toy and they're not showing any signs of frustration. They're really doing quite well. And so you're going to read those cues. You're going to read the fact that they're paying attention. The babies are calm. Their faces are soft. They have nice gentle body movements, like just the fingers are playing and they have nice soft uh, facial expressions. But if we get to the point that maybe we've overwhelmed them, we weren't exactly sensitive, then that's when we could probably see them start to lose attention. So probably the first thing is that rather than really looking at the toy, now they start to look away. They're starting to move away, look away from you. Um, and though they may you know, start to show other signs uh, or they may just plain move away from you if they have that capacity. So we kind of have to think about, okay, that maybe didn't go so well. What happened? Did we do too much? Did we intervene too quickly? Did we try and change the game? So in other words, they, we got tired of banging the toy and we decided to shake it. And that was like, oh, that's not the rules. And they get you get this big sense of frustration. Now, remember, as I said, sometimes crying and a little bit of frustration is OK. But if you just pause, wait, then they may come back or it may be enough at that moment. And then repetition, repetition, repetition. They love to do the same thing over and over again. You know how they love the book. They want the same book. They want you to same the change the page is the same way. They want you to say the words the same way. And for us, it may be like, oh my gosh, could we change this game? But for them, that's how they're solidifying the skill. They love to repeat. I once heard that when a baby is learning a new task, especially when it comes to movement, um, they can repeat that little movement up to 600 times before it becomes bang. That's mine. That's my skill. I have it now. I own it. So it's the same idea. So we don't want to necessarily, no, no, I don't want to read that book or I don't want to bang that block. They need to do it because that's how they're learning and that's how they're going to succeed. And as they succeed, then they can move on to the next step. If they're having trouble succeeding, what all you're going to do is maybe, okay, what could I do to help them achieve that success? Maybe piling the blocks. Maybe they need a little bit of stability on the bottom block. So that's all you maybe have to do is go in and hold the bottom block and they keep trying to put the block on the top. And that may be your part, your coaching for a while. And then maybe as they build the blocks, you're going to like, oh, let's knock it over. Let's see what happens there. And so but the key thing here is you may be bored, but they're not. And so they're the leaders of the game. You want to play with them. So you're going to go along with it. And the other thing too, is to be responsive. Obviously this little toy isn't going to be that responsive with that beautiful face, but you're really going to like smiling and, and clapping and be there for them. So that speaks a little bit to putting the phone down, putting the screens down, because if you're not available for them, you can't be responsive. And then they don't necessarily know that they're being successful or you're not know, helping them with their own being able to play with the toy, be, achieving that attention, that focusing on the toy. But very important to be responsive, especially as the baby succeeds in the little game. And anything can be fun. Anything can be playful. It doesn't have to be a really fancy toy. It could be the box that the toy came in. It could be, um, as we used to see in, in the clinic, the tape measure when we were measuring the head, you know, for measuring 
the hat. Let's play for the hat. And they had great fun just with the tape measure, two-handed play, taking a taste of it, making it look like a snake, making it look like a skipping rope. It doesn't have to be fancy, but it's all, everything can be playful and everything, anything that you use will end up involving all areas of development. So fine motor requiring two hands, playing with the spoons, hanging onto one hand, the spoons drop down, you grab the other one, then the other one. Gross motor, you got to have, you have to have the ability to sit or to weight bear on your arms when you're in prone. All of these things, um, any of these items, no matter what you're playing, will help overall development. Giving a sound to the toy, giving a word to the toy, a little bit of problem solving, a little bit of investigation and a manipulation of the toy, helping cognition. And then again, one of those key things is paying attention if that little item that you've now brought out or they've discovered is caught, is helping them focus and paying attention, then it's a learning item and it's a playful item. Play space. Um, important. There's not too much distraction. We often love the big toy box, but especially you know, I would say for our prems who sometimes focusing and attention can be a little difficult, a little problematic. The last thing you want is this big toy box that's just full of toys because you know what the game is going to be is everything is thrown out and there's not really much attention paid to anything one thing so uh, a great suggestion is get your shelves uh, put your little bins and similar items are put together in a bin so uh, and then the, the bin comes out as you want but here if it's too busy you're not going to get that uh, good attention. You're not going to get that focused play. Um, something like this is going to give you a bit more attention, a bit more focusing, um, and then a little bit easier to interact with them with that toy. Um, and then the, in the kitchen, always a great place because um, if a, a meal has to be prepared, that's where the parent is going to be. So they have their own drawer, their own shelf, and the parent is ne nearby. So you're available. You can quickly step in or you can do a little bit of interaction um, while they're playing here. And there's no greater fun than playing in the kitchen um, with toys that seem to be similar to what mommy and daddy are playing with. So I just want to repeat that. Um, and again, though, you want to turn off the background TV. So I'll talk about screen time in a minute. But the background TV is whether they're actually it's actually directed to the child. It can be very disruptive and very, uh, it can really break the attention and the focus. You can see that if you have some adults in the room and there's a TV on in the background, while the adults may have the capacity to talk to each other, if you watch, they constantly keep looking back to the TV. So it's breaking the attention, it's breaking the focus. And as I said, we need attention and focus uh, for ongoing learning and development. So we want to keep that background TV off. Um, this, another uh, great thing is, you know, especially as we're working, our, the babies, the children may be in a daycare situation, or maybe for those uh, parents right now where they have a baby in the NICU and they have a toddler at home. I think one of the really important thing is, you know, you come back home from a very busy day, whatever, you know, working or whatever's going on, and it be it mommy and or daddy would be ideal, is that on arriving home, there is this always this sort of guaranteed uninterrupted playtime. So mommy, daddy come home, um, and the child begins to learn that this is a time where we're going to play. Uh, and it's uninterrupted. They're not, you're not going to worry about getting the dinner done. You're not going to worry about doing the laundry or any other chores. You just come home and you play. Uh, 10, 15 minutes, uninterrupted play, uh, whatever, or whatever toy they want, whatever they want to do. And with time, they learn that the, it's that trust that that play is going to happen. And I think for um, children, maybe that toddler who's at home and the new baby's in the unit, and so attention has been really taken away from them. That's a really important thing. And it starts to really build, again, that trust. Um, and again, that guaranteed interaction time. So you really want that. Um, again, this is a really good picture of that shared attention, which is very key to ongoing learning. So they're both looking at the same toy. 
So I think the message here is you get home after a busy day and you want to start the dinner or you want to do the laundry. You're not going to do it. Your priority is just at least 10 or 15 minutes of that nice play. Again, helping learning, but helping that sort of emotional development. Things are going on um, and it becomes a time of them feeling really good. Mommy or daddy are home and it's a really a good time of feeling good and feeling safe and uh, secure. And then screen time. Uh, so there's lots of uh, guidelines that we can read about there. So just talking about the Canadian Pediatric Association guidelines on screen time. They also say young children learn um, best with face-to-face -face interaction um, and uh, with a caring adult. So for any babies, children under the age of two, uh, no screen time is recommended. So, and though I like that they added this, the exception is video chat with a caring adult or uh, an extended family, but there's no advantage and there's no learning from screen time. So under the age of two, put it away. Two to five, uh, limited uh, screen time, about an hour or less a day. We all know what we mean by screen time, digital media. The, this was a, a newer word for me, technoference. Um, and so it's the interruption of routine interaction play by screen time. So I think we have to look at it not only in terms of what it's directed to the child, uh, child TV, child programs, child games on the screen, um, the background TV, the TV that's on all the time in the background, but also too, we can see that if adults are spending too much time um, on their own screen, that uh, that is interfering with their own interaction with the child. And what tends to happen is the child behavior tends to be less than optimal because they're trying to gain attention. If the child is focusing and playing with the toy as you had hoped, um, then you may not put that screen down. But if they suddenly become a little less, more frustrated and a little bit more demanding, that's when you're going to put the screen down. So I think it's really important that the screen time applies not only to the child, but to the, to the parent. Um, and now um, first year of development. So we've got these guidelines that I've talked about and you're gonna think about that with play. And when we look at the first year of development, um, in the first three months, our ba babies are very much into sensory play. It's all about touching, feeling, uh, trying to grab a hold of things. So when you're presenting them at, and, and looking and, and hearing, um, all the senses are involved and they're really getting information from all their senses and that's contributing to their learning, um, to their language, even to their, to their motor development, because as something happens, they have to sort of pause and they, they're learning to, the sound is off in one direction. Now I'm going to start turning my head towards that. So that's starting to give them head control, trunk control. Um, if you're giving them a toy, uh, before the three month mark, it's very difficult if the toy is dead center for that them to reach up and grab it from the dead center. So that's a little bit too much for them, but you'll see that maybe the hand is a bit more active off to the side. So that's where the toy is gonna go is so that it's well within reach and you can actually just put it in their hand and in a way that you facilitated their play already. From three to six months, it's really then about reaching out from the midline, bringing the toys to the midline, and it's going to end up in the mouth. It's okay. It's very important that the toy or whatever goes in the mouth. The mouth gives them a lot of information. The mouth is like another hand. Um, so everything is going to go in the mouth. Um, and for uh, us to be in the way and trying to stop it and not make it happen, it's very frustrating. And you'll see that right away you're going to lose them. They're, they're going to show you signs of frustration. They're not really going to engage with you. Um, and they're not going to engage with the toy. So it's a very normal developmental uh, task that it's grabbed onto, fine motor, brought to the midline, and there's lots of mouthing around it. Um, and that's great. And so we don't, we don't really want to interfere with that. We want to let it happen. Obviously, then keep the toy clean if, if you're very concerned about that. But um, the mouthing and the toy to the mouth will, 
will probably stop around about 12 months and then you won't see it anymore because they know then it's food food goes in the mouth you may see the odd pick up a toy give it a little taste now that's not i can't eat that and then they'll eat the food obviously so that's how they learn it's all about that six to nine months they're starting to become more social uh they're starting to really be uh aware because they're now starting to achieve it they're coming up off the surface they're starting to sit they're able to start looking around they're able to start using their hands starting to mouth it again still and you're starting to see a little bit of sounds coming through so all of these things are coming together if you're playing and their sitting is still a little unsteady that may be how you're going to help them you may give them a little bit of support in their sitting so that they can play with their hands but you're there you're engaged with them and you're available uh, around nine months then they start to move so they're going to start moving and they start exploring the environment they may start moving away from you but they may they're going to come back um, and so those are all things that we want to see happen around that point joint attention that shared attention is going to start appearing around this nine month mark so you're going to start to see that idea that they're looking they may look to you and then they want to look at the, the object that they're looking at and this joint attention is very important so we want to see that emerging around about the nine month mark our first play experience is that social interaction. Um, and it's really important here that especially as the, the baby starts to look at you around about six weeks, because your face is becoming very clear. And so our first reaction is as the baby looks to you and you might start, they might give you start to give you a little smile. You're going to go, oh, wow, that's great. But the problem will be is probably a little bit too much. So this mother here is being a little subtle. She's got a nice little smile. They got nice on contact and the baby is able to achieve that. But if this mummy had done that to this baby, it probably would have been a bit too much. And it would have caused the baby probably to, to look away, maybe be a little uh, stressed about it. Um, and it's not that they don't want to look at you. They definitely want to look at you, but it was a little bit too much stimuli. So it's again, sort of grading what you're doing in reaction to the baby. So you let the baby look at you, then you can add a little smile, then you can add your voice, then you can add your facial movements. And so that's what I mean. You're sort of adding a little bit more as the baby can accept it or as your toddler can accept it. And then you can see you're getting this interaction. This is what you want to achieve. Um, motor development. Motor is driving it all, especially in the, in the first uh, month or the first year, that gross motor, the big muscle movements, the movement. And that's what's also going to give you the fine motor. Um, so as I said, uh, with eye contact, which comes around about the six week corrected mark, um, also comes the ability to keep the head in the midline. So that's sort of your big motor uh, milestone goal is that the baby can start to keep the head in the midline. That shows that they're starting to gain that truncal strength. They can keep their head here and now we can achieve interaction or eye contact which now starts to give us interaction uh which starts to you can see already the baby is focused attending now you get your interaction so it's all these keys that interaction uh, attention is leading to ongoing development if the baby's looking away and can't pay attention it's just that there's probably a little bit too much information so back it down just bring it down a little bit and you'll see that they'll be able to keep going. Uh, and if you've come across any therapist, anybody is going to tell you tummy time, tummy time on the tummy, uh, out of uh, seats, uh, get down on the belly, get down on the floor. That's where your abdominal muscles are going to be strengthened and very important because they're going to be weight bearing through their arms as they weight bear through their arms. This is what's going to help build the strength and give them the appropriate fine motor skills. This is not only is this a gross motor task, it's a fine motor task. Um, and it also becomes the beginnings of learning. So now I can lift my head up. I can start to look around the environment. I can start to see things that, oh, wow, I'd really like to start moving towards that. And very, again, very focused attention as they can get themselves up against gravity. And when we talk about that, we also need time on the floor on our back because uh, being on our back gives us this anti-gravity. So you're able to come up against gravity. It starts to work the abs, hands to the mouth. Again, very important. Do not put mittens on, let them explore their hands. These are very important tools and that's how they learn about them. Same with the feet, the feet in the mouth 
Again, it shows that there's abdominal strength and they need to learn about those feet. Those are important tools. They're part of me. So it's all part, again, all of these things are about learning and play. Babies need to learn to shift. So shift their weight. So when they're on their back, they're shifting their weight from their, from their bum, their tail to their head. When they're on their tummy, they're shifting their weight from their head to the tail. And now we start to move around about four months side to side. So playing and helping them attend to these things will help all these gross motor skills um, develop. And as I said, babies need to use that. We need to build their strength in their arms. It helps their fine motor skills. And babies are going to use their arms to move in the first year. So part of this tummy time, supported sitting, all about building the strength in the arms, um, because that's how they're going to move. Until they're walking, they're going to use their arms. Um, you need to be down on the floor. You can never fall off the floor out of plastic containers. And we have seen with studies that the more time that the babies spend on their tummy, on the floor, when awake, it's better motor skills, better overall development, better attention, better interaction. All of those things are connected. Um, and then as babies start to move, as we start to move into the second year, uh, you get lots of variety of movements, lots of exploration of the environment. But one thing is we do not need to place them in stand. They will rise to stand when they're ready. So as they rise to stand, it shows that they've developed the strength. They're problem solving. How do I get up there? What do I do to get myself up there? How do I, where do I shift my body? So very attentive. And then as they come up into standing, it also becomes a big paradigm shift. So they're steady. They should be in standing. That's where their brain is at. And then they can really start that social interaction in an upright position. So again, very important, just let them do it on their own. Uh, feeding, feeding and eating is a great learning activity. It's feeding, the muscles that we use for feeding is pre-speech. So we really want age appropriate feeding textures when, uh, when appropriate. Uh, feeding is oral motor, fine motor, hands to mouth, gross motor, you have the ability to sit or reach out and put the food in your mouth. It's problem solving, how to get the food in the mouth. It's joint attention, mommy, baby, eating, feeding, uh, things like that. Social, emotional, interactive, attention. So you're just helping, you're guiding, um, and messy is learning. So let it happen. Don't be concerned about the mess on the face. Just let it happen. Language development, um, in the first six months, it's almost the international language. It's the vowels, a, ah, e, a, ah, u. So all babies speak the same first, the same language in the first, basically first year, but especially in the first six months. The consonants start after about the second, in the second half of the first year. Generally, ba and da happens earlier because it's where the tongue sits in the mouth. So that's why we get that. Ma, ma, ma comes towards the end of the year. So. What you're going to do, though, to encourage language is you're going to repeat. They make those sounds. Ah, you make those sounds. Ah, ba, ba. So back and forth. And when they make the sounds, you're going to be really responsive to the sounds. You're going to, you're going to imitate them. They're going to imitate you back and forth. But wait, don't overpower them. They go ba, ba. You go ba, ba. And wait, don't keep going. Ba, 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 ba. You need to wait for their response. The other thing is don't ask them so many questions because they're probably not going to answer you. Like, how are you doing today? What do you want to do? What do you want to play? You, you need to watch. And I know I'm at big fault for that. Just watch how many questions you're asking. Label the objects, ball, bell, bubbles. Um, so they pick out from all of the language what you're, what's the most important thing. You're going to talk, but you're not going to give so many words. Oh, we're, today we're going to do this, and it's the yellow ball, and then we're going to do this with it, and da, da, da. Again, you want to make it a little bit more succinct so that they can pick out what the key words are. And again, over and over, no screen time. Screen time has been shown to delay language development, interfere with attention, interfere with joint attention. So all of those th screen time will definitely interfere with our, our language development. In the second year, just quickly, um, 12 to 18 months is all about learning to walk and practice, practice, practice. Uh, really learning to manipulate with their hands. Cognition is all about cause and effect. That joint attention is going to be well established by about the 18 month. 
and language is all about babbling blah, 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 and you'll start to get the single words coming out in the second half of that uh, second year they're moving faster they're climbing they're more manipulation more hand eye coordination and cognition and i love this it's all about problem solving so mischief is learning mischief means the brain is working so they're climbing they're getting up on the counters whatever whatever they're doing is when it's gone quiet they're probably up to mischief so you're going to be available because boy that brain is working so they are trying to figure something out and language the two words are starting to come together so there's some good resources, uh, zero to three.org, lots of ideas, act actual play ideas. So I haven't talked about that because I've given you more strategies. Pathways.org, uh, a great book by Jim Barry, Parents Guide to Play, more around the ideas because you're probably thinking, well, I don't know what to do. So lots of ideas. Um, and then on the follow up uh, website at Sunnybrook, there's a great um, for parents, especially in the first year, lots of ideas around play and what's strategies and what's going on in that first year. And thank you very much. I'm finished, I think, on time. Maureen, thank you so much. I was laughing here about asking too many questions because this is also apply, it still apply for teenagers. I am on that phase right now. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's, but it's forever. <laughs> such a great talk so many amazing tips and i know you need to go very short but i really i have two questions for you that i think is very important for families watching us because some, yeah. when we come from the nice we are so overwhelmed wow. with you know the journey they are leaving behind but bringing pieces of that journey home and we are tired we're exhausted figuring out what to do at home with this baby um and sometimes the last thing you think about is play with the baby because you have all these other things to do and worry about and appointments so from your talk what i gather is you don't really every moment can be a play moment changing yes. the diaper or feeding or leave the baby on the floor but talk to the baby from wherever you are in the room is that I, we don't want parents to feel guilty if they don't have the time or the energy or in the mental health space to sit down and play. So talk to us a little bit about that. Right. So play is that's why especially I tried to focus a little bit on that social interaction. So you're just holding your baby, just getting them to look at you. You're sitting, you're relaxed. Um, you're not being driven by other tasks, but just trying to get them to look at you keep your face calm. And as they start to look at you a little more, then you're going to add a little more, you're going to talk to them. But that social interaction, that eye contact and that back and forth, the smiling is the key to everything. So if you can just begin to do that, or you're changing the diaper, getting them to look at you, getting them to calm down and get that eye contact. Those are the very basic, very essential things. So if in all of the tasks you have to do, that's what you're starting to achieve, that the baby can look at you and you start to get the smile, you start to get the babbling. You're well on your way to good play experiences. So it's simple, but as you said, every little opportunity is a little bit of that talk and it comes very easily afterwards. It becomes very innate because and it, you don't even have to sit and analyze it anymore. It's just happening, but it's that interaction and that quiet, focused attention is what you're really wanting to achieve in the beginning yes so and one last question before you go um you talk about the guidelines for certain ages and uh, just a reminder for the families about the corrected age when those milestones we kind of don't like to use the milestones but those um what the baby is supposed to be doing at certain ages uh will be according to the corrected age so can you talk always a according bit to the correct age patients that parents should have and when to actually seek help so yes it's it's very important so we always maintain the corrected age um it used to be in the world when we only were looking at you know you know, 26, 28 weekers, we only correct it to about 18 months corrected. And now with the with the younger and the younger babies, we're starting to correct further out. Um, but development is a bit fluid. So sometimes, you know, things are moving faster than other things. So especially like in the first year, it's all about movement. 
and you may not have so much language development. Or you may have a baby who's a little bit more stationary, but you're getting more fine motor movement and you're getting more language. But if along the way, I think for any baby, especially a baby who's had a mommy has had a, a parent who's had a preterm baby, there's always anxiety. So I think everybody should feel free to reach out to their clinic, um, to their family doctor, their pediatrician, and say, well, you know, is this okay? But there's a range in development. So just like weight has a huge range um, in what's what's good, so is there a range for development. So babies sometimes need time. Time is often a baby's best friend. A little bit of time and you're providing some of those guidelines, tummy time, some of that interaction. Things will come as the babies start to get a little bit healthier. And then obviously if you're totally freaked out, you go get help. <laughs> That's wonderful. Maureen, thank you so much for You're joining welcome. us a here pleasure. today. It's so great to always learn from you and you have so much information that is so helpful for families. So thank you. And I hope I see you uh, sometime soon at the Premier Chat. For sure. Thank you. Thank you. And to all of you watching us live today, thank you so much for joining this episode of the Premier Chats. And a special thank you to our sponsor, AstraZeneca, who makes education sessions like this one possible. And just a reminder that if you missed part of today's session, head over to our website, which is the Canadian uh, to see this episode and all past editions of the Premier Chats. You find also many resources and support options available there. And you also be reminded that CPBF is a charitable organization and depends on support to continue its important work. So consider how you can support CPBF in its mission to empower families of premature babies in every step of their journey. Together, we can create a brighter future for all preemies and their families. And we'll see you again next Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Stay well.